How far would you go to get your child off the internet? Would you send him here, the middle of nowhere? I'm saying got, got to go! Tonight, three desperate families have reached the point of no return. <laughs> Their loved ones lost for hours on social media and video screens. You have used the term digital heroin. Is it that bad? Is this your life? Could it be? Just ask them. A husband in his basement man cave, gaming all night. Yeah, do it, do it. I was going to bed as a newlywed, and he was staying up and playing video games. A teenage daughter glued to her cell phone. And knocked down drag out fight to get that phone out of her hand. I was up all night sending pictures. Secret sexting. Mm -hmm. Upstairs, while your mom and dad are thinking you're safe. Mm -hmm. Now they're letting 2020 into their every day and every night lives. This is where you game, huh? Revealing their family secrets in video diaries. It's hard not to resent Chris, who is enjoying himself while I am pulling my hair out. But what can get them to stop? And what are the warning signs for your family? Your mother is afraid. Tonight, while our 2020 cameras are rolling, an intervention. Ah, where's my stuff? And signs of withdrawal. Tight in the chest. Now it's rehab and detox for devices. When I have the phone, I can at least talk to people. I feel like I'm fitting in. From heartbreak to hope, logged in to unplugged, can they make it? I love you. Good evening, I'm Elizabeth Vargas. And I'm David Muir. We all want to stay connected, but right here tonight, the jaw-dropping video of people who can't put their devices down. Your friends, your family, your neighbors, perhaps even yourself. But right here tonight, you will also see the MRIs, what this could be doing to your brain. David, we spent a year on the road meeting people who were held hostage to their devices, getting them to open up about themselves and the secrets in their homes. We're not using their last names because they could be any of us. But the good news is they got unhooked, and you can too. Walk down any street, any mall, any hallway, everyone is bowing to their screen. Our devices are beeping, buzzing, begging us to swipe, like, love, tweet, retweet, send, reply, forward. FaceTime, Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, Tumblr, Vine, Kick. This is Brooke, a California teenager. She's 15 years old now and a self-professed recovering cell phone and social media addict. How long was she on her phone each day? When she got home from school at like, you know, three o'clock until she went to bed at nine. It was more. It was more. Brooke says she would be up until four o'clock in the morning and later. A second a text went off, a second, you know, someone Snapchats me or FaceTimes me, like, I always answered and I always waited and waited and waited for someone to reply. It was like oh, my heart, like I couldn't put it down. Teenagers have always had a fear of missing out, but it's just mushroomed. It's, it's nuclear. And Brooke's selfies reveal a troubling progression, imitating bad behavior she was exposed to online with her phone. The more she started to change and act out, the more we started to really Clamp down. Clamp down. Mm -hmm. And then that created anger. Brooke was always two clicks ahead of her parents, Jim and Stephanie. I was constantly making different accounts. Mm -hmm. I had like six accounts on Instagram. I had multiple Snapchats. Um, I changed the usernames, the passwords. Um, I would block them. We took her phone. She'd go and buy someone else's phone. How are you so smart about all this? Honestly, I don't know. I just... It was like they took my phone and I just panicked. Anytime her parents took the phone away, Brooke would go ballistic. It was like a knockdown, drag out fight practically to get that phone out of her hand. She would say that without my phone, I have nothing. There was no relationship. We were just a means to provide her with food and shelter and, and money. And a phone. And a phone. And a phone. <sighs> A winter night in Michigan, an ordinary house on an ordinary street. People just trying to get some sleep. But somebody's up late, trigger happy with that rat -a -tat keyboard on a computer playing first person shooter video games. The boy in the bedroom is Josh. 
He's 14 years old, and his parents, Al and Christina, say he won't stop, can't stop playing. What's a typical day in Josh's life? Mm, sleeping until 11, 12, and then he would be on until like 1, 2 in the morning. 12 hours. Easily. Yeah. Easily Good. 12. Yeah. They say Josh's obsession began in eighth grade when he built himself a gaming computer and installed it in his room. Get out. Jesus. You think that was the turning point? Oh, definitely. Yeah, that was much more exciting to be on and much more addictive. Josh says he's playing up to 60 hours a week. Josh has been in his room since four o'clock, nearly five hours gaming. But why didn't right. you just take the computer away? I don't understand. Because when we did take it away, there was a lot of problems in our house with his behavior. They confiscate the computer, shut down the Wi-Fi, even remove the router and lock it in the car. Josh responds by throwing things and punching walls. There was like a shutdown in communication. Was it just the constant fighting with mm -hmm. him? Yeah, this? it was very emotional. Al is not only afraid of what Josh might do, he's afraid of what he might do. If it got further, it, it could have been a problem. It could have been physical, and I didn't want that. And so it, he was it, trying to physically stop you? Yeah, 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 yeah. He throws up his hands and leaves Christina to handle the conflict on her own. And sometimes it does get physical. They exaggerate. Like my mom thinks that I hit her because she takes away my games. I don't do that. She calls it hitting because I like swat her hand away. There's just a lot of anger, lots of anger. Emotional outburst. Yeah. It sounds completely out of control. Yeah, it was. Josh, you need to get off. Okay, stop. Midnight, 1 a.m., 2 in the morning. Why are you stalking me? All these late night fights leave Christina exhausted. You know, it's after three o'clock and I told you to get off at one. Stop. If you want to make changes, it's hard work. They it's turn to Kevin Roberts. He works with kids having um, trouble with too much so screen time. Do you have any support? Do you have it doesn't have to be just gaming. It could be texting. Uh, it could be the smartphone. Roberts is the author of Cyber Junkie and Get Off That Game Now. Your mother is afraid to get rid of the video game system and the computer because she's afraid of how you'll react. It's not my fault that she's scared of me. What's, what's this one, you think? In Ohio, we meet Maria, 40 years old, what? an attorney, mother of four. Good job, Jude. She's not a single mother. It just seems that way. She has a husband, Chris, aged 44, but you can't meet him right now because although Chris and Maria have built a life together, careers, a nice home, beautiful children, on any given evening, Chris is down in the basement, past the pink castle and the buckets of children's toys. You may think he's too old for this, but the average video gamer is 35. Oh, someone shot me in the face. Oh, I'm running toward the front line. And this one has been taken prisoner by a pastime. You're done. Jeez. Chris was still playing video games, so we ended up coming to the park. Um, and having some fun here. How many hours a day does he spend playing games? He'll take a whole Saturday and go into the evening, wake, when he, from the time he wakes up till... The time he goes to the bed? The time he goes to bed, yeah. So, 18 hours? Possibly. It's 2 a.m., and um, I just checked in on Chris, and he's still playing video games. Ever since they got married more than a decade ago, Maria says Chris is often a no-show for much of their life. Happy Thanksgiving. I'm headed up to our family football game. Chris opted not to play with us. He is going to be playing video games instead. Uh, Why would you stay with a partner who is that disengaged? I don't know. I think that I really felt like this was a in sickness and in health moment. And yes, it's hard, but I was committed to him and I still am committed to him. So we have a house full of people and he is in the basement playing video games. Oh God, come here bro, come here. Missing life's sweet yeah. moments. So Bailey's trying blackberries for the first time. Maria is there to see their toddler's first taste of a blackberry and so are you. What do you think, Zaley? Do you like them? 
you love him? The only one not there is her father, Chris. All right, what's next, boys? Part of your heart must break for what he's missing. It does. They're living in a split screen. Chris gets online, Maria gets the kids in line. Playtime for him, bath time for her. Downstairs, play. Upstairs, pray. I am going to go to bed because I'm super tired. This is how we function, and um, uh, this is how we do it. Still ahead, risky behavior right under her parents' roof. We were blown out of the water when the police showed up at our house. Oh. And inside the mind of an extreme gamer, can the screen change your brain? But she looked at this and thought, this is a kid in trouble. Stay with us. In Ohio, it's time to meet the man in the basement. Wait, 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 where's your tank, bro? Maria's husband, Chris. Dad. Yes, all right. Chris comes home from work. It may or may not surprise you to know his job is IT, servicing computers. When he walks in the door, it looks like any other normal family. See, it's tough. Okay, go, go ahead and run out your problem now, all right? But his wife Maria says, just watch. Yeah. Doting dad is itching to disappear. Yes, I think I'm gonna head down. Gosh, I keep returning as this machine gun guy. And I've played just terribly at this dude. Um, Chris shows us his collection of obsessions. Oh, wow. No fewer than 158 carefully organized games. Right. This is where you game, huh? Yeah, matter of fact. Matter of fact. It's a um, nice setup. He tries to show me what all the excitement is about. You need to say, hey, you sucker, I put you down that quickly. It's something where you can remove yourself from, you know, from the world for an hour. Um, or more. Or more. <laughs> and watch what happens when Maria comes downstairs to check on Chris before she goes to bed. Hey, babe. Hey, Maria. I am going to head to bed. Hi, right, good night. All right, Jane. Do you think you're addicted to these games? Uh, I'd say, I'd say addiction is there. Chris says he's considering cutting back, but quit for good? never i can't stop forever that just seems like a even though you know that it hurts your wife and your children and and yeah every next thing i say it sounds more <laughs> more and more like the scared addict in california brooke's parents say her phone and social media fixation opened a portal into a dark place her risky behavior escalated when she was just 11 and 12 years old. Just hanging out with the wrong crowd, drugs, sex, in middle school. With that phone always in her hand, her parents wondered whether any place was safe. Okay, she's home, she's safe, but it was a complete false sense of security because she's up there in her room you know, with her phone on the internet. And as her parents later discover, sexting with strange men. I was up all night sending pictures. Of yeah. yourself? Mm hmm To strangers? Yeah. When I did it and I got those compliments, I got that attention, and it, it just made me feel really good. It's unnerving to listen to you tell me about how you fell into this world of secret sexting. Mm-hmm. Upstairs, yeah. you weren't safe. Not at all, no. It's not just the phone and the internet. Brooke has ADD and attachment issues. When you take a phone and social media and you put it in the hands of a, you know, a teenager and then throw in some mental illness, she, she just becomes very vulnerable. But her parents don't realize just how vulnerable until they get a knock on the door. We were blown out of the water when the police showed up at our house. Oh my gosh. Officers revealed what their little girl had been doing online. The men, the nude photos, all of it. You know people watching this are going to say, where were you? Yep. It was shocking. It was. I guess I thought of her just as a regular, everyday little girl growing up. Words spread on social media about Brooke's mistakes, 
bullied and shamed, she tried to numb the pain with drugs and alcohol. I think you used the word broken. Yeah. Do you have any idea how you got that way? I think I just got to a point where I kept getting hurt. I kept doing things that I knew didn't make me happy. And then an act of desperation. Brooke wrote a note on her phone. And somehow, by the grace of God, her parents say, it accidentally popped up on their shared iCloud account. I said, what's that? So I opened it up, and it was a suicide note. A suicide note? What, what did you think reading that? <laughs> I couldn't believe it. You know, it was, uh, it was scary. I just got to a point where I just didn't even know, like, know why I was here and yeah. why I was still trying. You mean why you were here on Earth? Yeah, it just didn't make sense to me anymore. Yeah. They had Brooke committed to a hospital that night. That was it. That's when we knew. That was it. We got to do something drastic. The first thing the attendants took from her was her phone. Brooke wanted to like fight the nurse for it. I was like, don't touch me. I was pissed. The despise in her face for us. Betrayal. She was I'm... so angry. She was so pissed off. But there was no other way. I just kept thinking, you know, you're not going to die on my watch. In Michigan, Josh begins skipping school. He told me a couple times, I'm going to be, you know, a gamer. And I can make a lot of money, Mom. Believe me, I've got it all figured out. I was like, ooh, this is not good. And then, no more school. There are some things going on with this ADHD, and then there was some underlining depression. So that wasn't just all the gaming. Al and Christina are wondering what's going on inside Josh's head. If only there was a way to peek inside that adolescent brain. Well, it turns out there is. You had an MRI before? Josh is getting a functional MRI as part of a new study by Dr. David Rosenberg. His theory, yet to be proven, is that excessive gaming changes brain activity. These triplets are in the study, too. Turn it off now. Stop, Mom. You're still playing. You know? I said I'm going to watch. I said I'm going to go play outside with Josh. I I'm going to go play outside with Josh. That's Noah. You can see why his mom says gaming has more of a hold on him than on his brother and sister. These are the triplets' brain scans. Two are typical, but Noah's is not. Dr. Rosenberg highlighted areas in red he says represent brain activity involving memory, attention, and decision-making. Noah's is almost completely gray. But now look at Noah's brain after three weeks unplugged at summer camp. He's gone from being barely lit up to being highly. He's highly lit up, yeah. Now for Josh's results. There should be much more activity. There should be more red. There should be more red. She looked at this and thought, this is a kid in trouble. This is a kid in trouble. Still ahead, what's it going to take to throw Josh off his game? How about 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness with no temptation? Stay with us. Early morning in Michigan, a scene right out of Josh's video game. A couple of guys come to the house and gently but firmly hustle him away into the darkness. He knew it was coming. It's just kind of stupid. I just play video games and I have to go to a rehab for it. But when the day came, he wasn't ready. Josh really getting emotional. He goes, I don't want to go. I'm scared. I want to see my mom. Josh has flown to Salt Lake City and then driven hours away into the Utah wilderness and a program called Unplugged at Outback Therapeutic Expeditions. He and a group of other boys will camp for weeks in this rugged terrain. There is no running water, no electricity, no screens. The only thing that glows in the dark, a campfire and the moon. In Ohio, no one is getting on a plane, but Chris and Maria are hoping for a game changer. We arrange for a house call. Addiction specialist, Nick Carderas. So what are you gonna say to him? Well, so my whole purpose is to try to find out where he's at on his whole with ownership of his addiction. Does he acknowledge that there's a problem? Inside, before Chris decides if he's ready to unplug from his gaming habit, an emotional hug from his oldest children, a reminder of how much they need him. 
And then a big test. He wants Chris to get the video games out of the house. We could box them up and they could be stored somewhere. Chris is at a crossroads. Are you willing to take this opportunity? <clears throat> Not next month. Yeah, I'll, 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 um, I'll step up. I'll try it. Then it's time to pack up Chris's obsession. All right, here we go. Okay. It's slightly painful. Those buckets for children's toys come in handy. I want to go back to when we knew each other better. Yeah, I agree. That's really nice. We don't hug. We don't hug again. What's wrong with all these so-called cyber junkies? Is their extreme behavior a disorder or just a symptom of something else? That is a subject of heated debate among scientists. Is there really such a thing as digital addiction? I think the answer is unequivocally yes. It impacts a developing brain in exactly the same way a substance addiction can. Carderis has written a book called Glow Kids. You have used the term digital heroin. Really? Digital heroin? Is it that bad? Maybe there's some shock value to that. Maybe I'm trying to shock some parents awake to say, this is a potentially addictive device. Be careful. The American Psychiatric Association's diagnostic manual includes internet gaming disorder as a condition requiring further study. And Dr. David Rosenberg is doing just that. Internet addiction clearly exists, but there's always, always an underlying cause or causes. The Entertainment Software Association, a trade group, says in a statement, legitimate science, objective research, and common sense all prove video games are not addictive. But digital addiction is taken seriously in some parts of the world. Asia has hundreds of treatment centers. The World Health Organization is poised to officially classify gaming disorder in its disease manual. Are we late to the party on this? Yes. I think we are late to the party in this. China has had internet addiction disorder as a diagnosable disorder for a few years now. We're not going to be able to help people change their behavior through shame and willpower. Software developer Gabe Zickerman says apps and games are designed to enthrall. He would know. He says he used to earn a living making them that way. My work in gamification in particular has been used uh, to make just about everything that people use today uh, more addictive and engaging. How do they do that exactly? Every time you challenge yourself to something and then you achieve that thing, your brain secretes a little bit of dopamine. Zickerman says he and developers like him designed games and apps to purposely activate those jolts of dopamine. But he's had a change of heart and career. He's created an app that helps users break the cycle of compulsion. And I'm using the exact techniques that I've used for the last decade to make things more addicting, to help people counteract the addictions they face. It all sounds so devious. I kind of picture them like twirling mm -hmm. their mustaches as we're kind of like, talking about this. Psychology professors Chris Ferguson and Patrick Markey study video gaming, and they say it's getting a bad rap. Are all these families just making this up? No, oh, no we're not accusing them of lying. So then if they're not addicted to their video games, you're telling me well, that that's, no, this the, is a moral panic. The question, though, is, is it the video games themselves that's causing the problem, yeah. or is it something they're lying? That's what we can't speak to. We don't know what was going on in these families. I don't so think make... parents, though, realize that those games have been manipulated. Well, I, I mean, I think manipulated, all we're talking about is they're trying to make them more fun, essentially. Still ahead. What happens when the fun and games and devices are gone? It's a little tough to think about even now. It's, it's making me feel some feels right now. Stay with us. <laughs>
Josh is enrolled in a treatment program called Unplugged. The organization waived his fee, which can run tens of thousands of dollars, hoping to raise awareness of the problem. If the boys want to survive, they will have to change their lives. What does that have to do with gaming? I don't, or anxiety or depression. Being able to kind of reset everything neurologically and, and, and mentally by taking them away from all the distractions of their typical life. After Josh has been in the wilderness for more than seven weeks, we go for a visit. I'm Elizabeth. It's very nice to meet you. All right, so show me around your camp. Josh shows me how he and the other boys live, carrying their few belongings in a homemade backpack, building shelter, preparing meals, nothing gourmet. Out here, peanut butter is a delicacy. Josh wanted to show off his new fire-making skills. Where do you do it, right here? Yeah. Oh my God. With disappointing results. Oh, I smell something. I got a lot of brown punk. A lot of brown? Yeah. That was pretty close. Well, we'll practice again later, okay? How's that gonna help you in life, do you think? Is it an example as like my anxiety? Like at first it was super hard for me to hike. Learning to overcome physical challenges here is a lesson Josh can take with him and apply to life challenges back home. So you're learning to push yourself. Yeah, my issues is like that I had gaming addiction. So I had anxiety and depression. And basically I just like use it as like escaping from it. Are you worried at all about going home and falling back into your old habits? Yeah, like I've had dreams at night where I'm just like playing video games and then it's just kind of like scary when I wake up. There's another milestone for Josh here on the mountain. He's turning 15, a birthday to remember. <sighs> Unlike Josh, Chris is facing his gaming problem right at home in Ohio, but there are still mountains to climb. I don't make it down here much. Um, it's just uh, kind of a place for the kids to play right now. Visiting his former gaming closet triggers intense emotions. Yeah, I freaked out about it. I remember kicking my couch. Watch Chris's reaction to those empty shelves. The games were here and surprise, the games were gone. I, I was just tight in the chest and it's a little tough to think about even now. I mean, it, it's, it's making me feel some feels right now. He documents his struggle to stay out of the game day by day. I'm day two of this 90 day detox, boredom, monotony, agitation week by week it is amazing this probably is the first week game free in <clears throat> years years and years marie assumed without games chris would spend more time with her and the kids but at least for now his intensive therapy is taking up four hours nearly every day i was kind of hoping that he would at least attempt to when he's with us um, be with us, but I, I wonder if right now it's just a little too much for him with the anxiety level. And although the games are locked away in a storage facility, he admits they still seem to have a hold on him. It's gray and cold and rainy, and uh, wouldn't it be nice just to head downstairs and just play some freaking video games? It's been nearly 20 months since Brooke first arrived at her treatment facility. We want to start off with some pretty tight limits and structure around your phone use. Periodically, Brooke is allowed to go home for visits. The trips are a test. Brooke's phone, normally locked away, is handed over. This is the first time she's had it since she got to go home last time. Brooke, how long has it been? I'd say probably a month and a half. How does it feel to have it back? It's really exciting because I just, I don't know, I miss like talking to my friends and so it's like exciting that I get to do that again. Brooke's mom, Stephanie, is going to the airport to meet her. I'm always hopeful. I'm hopeful every time that she comes home, but I'm also realistic and I know that it's, it's a real struggle for her. Okay, so Brooke looks like she is, has landed. Oh, oh, I didn't even say that she was part of the flight crew. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So good to see you. There's been a loss of trust in this family, and Brooke's parents take precautions. Out of sight, out of mind. We have a drawer here that we just keep some of our old devices in. We just kind of keep these 
hidden while she's here. Remember these? Oh, yeah. Most of the visit is going smoothly. When you made this in preschool. Paging through old memories of life before the crisis. <laughs> Watching home movies. <laughs> but at night, when Brooke has to hand over the phone, it's hard. Her painful past comes rushing back. She's feeling like the only teenager in the world who can't handle a phone. I guess I just feel really left out and like when I have the phone I can at least talk to people and feel like I'm fitting in still and like it just makes me feel like I'm missing out. <laughs> Even with all the improvement and all the progress you've seen her make, it isn't all better. No, right. it's not. No. That's still an issue, what social media does right. and, and allows kids to access and be vulnerable to. Yeah, it's a lifelong journey for her. There will still be highs and lows. Still ahead, a reunion in the mountains. Will sparks fly this time? Are you kidding? Should we cut the camera? Stay with us. Welcome to Salt Lake City, ladies and gentlemen. Where the local times are approximately 10, 13 a.m. Al and Christina travel from Michigan to Utah and then make the long journey over rough roads, tracing their son Josh's path into the western desert. I can't imagine what Josh was thinking the day he came out here. Yeah. Josh has been unplugged for more than seven weeks. They can't wait to see him, but first they have to find him. Josh is somewhere out here. And then you guys are going to signal for Josh using this. Okay. And okay. we're going right. to find him. Wyatt, a field staffer, gives them a wooden device called a bull roar, used in ancient oh. rituals to send signals over long distances. They stop and listen for a response from Josh, but nothing. Off in another part of the desert. Oh, come on. <sighs> Josh is having trouble. I swear to God, it was working like. I know, it was working yesterday. It's not a bad metaphor for the family's communication problems when Josh would shut himself away in his bedroom, gaming all night. Well, it's three in the morning. It's I time to get off now. Christina takes a turn. And at last, Josh responds. Is that it? That was it. That was it? That was it right there. Okay. Moments later, after the longest and most difficult separation of his young life, 54 days apart. There he is. Is he there? Yeah. Oh, there, he is. there he is. Hey, Josh. How are you? Good. Good to see you. Oh my God, you're getting bigger. Dad. Hey, Josh. You doing all right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Gosh. look at this. So this is your camp right here. As he did during my visit, Josh tries to show his mom and dad how he can make fire without a match. This time, the glowing ember in his hands comes to life. Here we go. <laughs> oh, yes. Right. My <laughs> oh, man. That was awesome. Remember the boy who could barely bring himself to put a few words together? This is a different Josh. When I got home, I didn't really notice that video games were, like, destroying me mentally and how it's, like, just as bad as substances, like, mentally. I just didn't notice that. I didn't like care at all. I just wanted to live, like play video games and that was it. That's all I really cared about. I mean, I literally skipped school for a month just to play video games. Okay, here, let me. Josh paints his parents' faces, a figure in red for his mom, standing between light and darkness. Even though like you were dealing with my gaming addiction, you could always like seek the light. You were always trying to find help for me. Oh, that's cool. Is it? Yeah, that's really cool. Al 
is moved by his son's recognition of their struggle to free him from his gaming obsession. Are you okay, then? <laughs> Jump cut the camera. It's okay. When you're ready, Josh. For his dad, two figures representing before and after. Well, you've changed a lot. I can see that you're trying to change. Okay. okay. Thank you. I love you. And then it's time for goodbyes. A dusty hug. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> and Al and Christina are heading back to Michigan. See you guys in a couple weeks. Josh will remain behind for now. He has more work to do in the desert. Still ahead, what difference will 10 weeks in the wilderness make? Okay, we're gonna get started then. Josh comes home and gets another brain scan. The results are next. it's time for a change in latitude. Chris and Maria are taking the kids for an adventure. Hey. Where are we going? To Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. Where are we going, Zizi? To Puerto Rico. They visit Puerto Rico every spring, but this year seems different. Going to the pool, go to the beach with my kids, and my family, and it's good. It's, it's good to get away. It'd be easy if I could be on vacation all the time. Weeks later, we drop in on Chris and Maria on a Sunday morning. With 53 game-free days behind him, Chris is out of the basement and killing it in the kitchen. One morning, several days earlier, Maria recorded another video diary. It's her birthday. I really don't have big expectations for my birthday. Um, but imagine the surprise when I came downstairs to this. He got me a gift and beautiful flowers and a, a really nice card. I'm really feeling a lot of hope and excitement and just some happiness. Your time at Outback has come to an end, but the journey continues. After 10 weeks unplugged in the wilderness, it's time for Josh to go home. I guess I get to sleep in a warm bed instead of on the <laughs> ground in the sleeping bag. <laughs> Al and Christina are getting ready, patching and painting Josh's room, removing that custom-built gaming computer. Ladies and gentlemen, it's our pleasure to welcome you to Detroit. Oh boy, there hey. he is. He's here. All right, welcome home. Yeah, here, let me give you a real hug. <laughs> oh, you still smell like sage. Home again, Josh has lost weight. He feels taller. And with a new haircut, he's a different boy. Now you gotta go back to reality. Yeah. Those aren't the only changes. A couple days later, Josh has a follow-up brain scan. Dr. David Rosenberg shows us the results. Wow. What you can see here is, yeah, this is an oh wow Same effect. Same boy. Same boy. Before treatment, after treatment. What is that telling you? He was completely shut down. When we talked with him here, he was exuberant, a different child. In California, Brooke and her family work together on a sign of renewal, a fresh coat of paint. I want to start over and make my room more positive. I think if I can take my story and make other people like think about things before they do it, help them to make a better life, I think that's really important to me. And then it's time for Brooke to return to rehab. She's done well on this trial visit, but there's more to treating those underlying issues than simply taking her phone away. Yeah, this is the worst day of the whole trip. Every time. Sad that she's leaving, but super happy that you know, she'll be back soon. It may be a sign of her recovery that saying goodbye to her mom is harder than ever. Do you feel like you have your daughter back? No, I have the new and improved Brookie. I do. Yeah. And she's worked so hard. And sing it to a blue sky. Shout until the boys come home. Don't you even ask why we just should give in to the good. 
happily on the road to recovery. To prevent this from happening really in your family, experts have given us these tips. No phone before the age of 10, no phone at the dining room table, media-free time together, and media-free locations as well, like bedrooms at home. Imagine us all talking again. That's right. I know. And for a list of warning signs and other resources, we put it all at abcnews.com for you. Thanks for watching tonight. I'm David Moore. And I'm Elizabeth Vargas, and I want to personally thank those families for letting us share their stories. For all of us here at 2020, good night.